the basic thrust behind the vertical integration movement is that the humanities need to engage in dialogue with other fields and allow what's been discovered in other areas of inquiry to affect the way they talk about things when, when, when this work in these other fields is relevant. So the short story would be if I come up with a theory of how language and cognition interact, language and concepts interact, if this conflicts with something we know about the way physical molecules work, that's a problem. That would be a problem in consilience. Until fairly recently, uh, until the last few decades, literature was uh, the, the best possible source of knowledge about human behavior. Uh, the social sciences, psychology, only began in the, in the very late part of the 19th century, and they haven't been very successful until fairly recently. Uh, behaviorism, which didn't tell us a lot about people. Uh, psychoanalysis, which told us all the wrong things about people. Uh, so if you actually want to get down to the ground to what it's like for you know, people to, uh, to experience things in a, in a given environment, about the only source for that was literature. People have been writing literature and studying literature for a long time to try to uh, reflect upon the human condition, not just for escapist entertainment, which is partially what, what, what fiction is about, and thank, thankfully so. It's about escaping into these other worlds and just having a good time. But uh, people have also always been interested in it as a source of understanding about really trying to work out deep problems about what it means to be a, a human being. And at some point, um, you know, in the last couple of hundred years, very, very recently, um, science started taking aim at some of these questions. And that's a very uh, new thing that science started moving out of the physical universe and moving uh, in between the years. And I think it was a natural uh, response of uh, humanist scholars to feel threatened by the incursion, to seal up, to get hermetic, to put up walls, and try to defend our turf. Um, and it was exactly the wrong response, in my opinion. What it led to was the continued marginalization of the humanities to the point where it is now a tedious cliche to say that the humanities are in crisis by enrollment, by funding, and so forth. The humanities are, are in decline. And the question is, are they declining towards, you know, apocalypse, which some people have claimed at some point, you know, in 30 or 40 years, there's really not going to be any humanities anymore. I think that's a little bit uh, panicked. Um, but, or are they sinking into a sort of near total cultural, cultural irrelevance? Well, they just aren't part of the conversation anymore. They're just off to the side. In the sciences, it was, uh, it was impossible really to study humanity in, in certain ways in the past, um, before Darwin uh, and before modern neuroimaging technology. Now we can look at the brain in fine, de fine detail, now we can look at, at, the, at human history in, in the long term and explain where we've, why we are because of where we've come from. And that was simply not possible uh, a, a century and a half ago. And now it is possible. And we're saying, you know, why don't people make use of, of these new tools that we have? Every once in a while, one discipline helps another discipline out, the way physics has helped chemistry out, uh, in the way in which Freudian psychology has helped politics out, uh, in the way in which plumbers sometimes help carpenters out and carpenters help plumbers. But nobody wants to bridge carpentry and plumbing, and I don't see any more reason to bridge the natural sciences and the humanities. The success of the natural sciences in unification has been due to their ability to break big things down into little things and then give microstructural accounts of macrostructural behavior. I don't think there's any analogy to microstructure in the social sciences or the humanities. The humanities are supposed to change the human self-image to make it possible for poets and prophets and thinkers to make suggestions about how human beings might conceive themselves. And imaginative suggestions of that sort aren't helped by microstructural analyses. So I don't see that the unification project that was successful within the sciences of nature can be extended outside of those borders. 
the reason that there's been this line between the natural sciences and the humanities is because it's based on a fundamental dualism between the body and the mind, between the physical and the mental or the person, right? Um, so when that boundary is crossed, we, we get uncomfortable in a way that we don't get uncomfortable when physical chemists move into organic chemistry. We think that's great, right? Um, so is that going to go away? And the answer, I think, some vertical integration people say it will, and that we'll have one seamless chain of, of explanation. I, I think that's wrong, and it's wrong just because part of the way we're built evolutionarily is to always see that line there. I think we're born dualists. I think there's been great work. Paul Bloom's a good person to look at on this. But we seem to be born seeing the world as made up of at least two types of substances, uh, physical things and minds. We irresistibly see mind in the world. And vertical integration fundamentally challenges that picture by arguing that the human, things at the human level, are explainable naturalistically. In other words, basically the human is just a very complex configuration of physical things. And that goes against our innate folk dualism. Qua human beings, we can never stop feeling like there's something different about me as a person versus me as a collection of physical things. And whenever you try to explain, if you want to try to explain me evolutionarily, I can intellectually understand what you're trying to say, but I'll never really feel it, right? Um, I, I, I am intellectually convinced that I love my daughter the way I do because of Hamilton's law, because she is, half of her is my genes, and my genes made me to want to protect my genes in whatever container they were in, and she's a little container for my genes. I don't see any intellectual explanation for parental love that makes any sense other than that. And yet, I'd be a, a psychopath if I really thought that, right? I love my daughter because I have these really powerful proximate mechanisms that whenever, whenever she does anything cute, which she's designed to do by evolution, it makes me just go crazy and I just would do anything for her. So as humans, we're in this weird position where we're, I think at a certain level, we're built by evolution to not really understand evolution intuitively. It seems to me that there's a strong inclination to think about evolutionary biology and its application to the understanding of human behavior in a wrong way. And that is to think as if there was some very general set of principles that evolutionary theory supplies us with that were just waiting to be applied to any old species that we cared to name, and in particular to us. Now, it doesn't really work that way. The way evolutionary biology works, I think, is it supplies us a toolkit for understanding certain facets of the organic world. How plants um, take the forms they do, distribution of plants and animals, uh, why various kinds of animals have particular kinds of organs and structures, and uh, in some cases, why they behave in the ways they do. But None of these things are generated in any sort of wholesale fashion, so we can just take a piece of evolutionary theorizing off the shelf and just simply apply it to ourselves. But the really best studies in evolutionary theory generally are those that sort of take into account the very specific details of the individual species or group of organisms with which um, the biologist is concerned. So when we turn to our own case then, it's necessary actually to look at human behavior rather specifically and not suppose that there's a general principle that we can apply that will find its application readily to ourselves. That means there's an awful lot of work to be done in this area, and it always amazes me the ease with which people who have spent years of their lives, as it might be working on some other organism, uh, social insects, for example, um, very well studied. E.O. Wilson is, has an amazingly deep and detailed knowledge of the behavior of social insects. People think, well, you know, I've done social insects, and now it's just a matter of applying the same principles to human beings. But you know, we aren't actually that similar to the social insects. There are quite a lot of differences, and those need to be taken into account. So you can't just sort of, uh, um, as it were, put in enormous amounts of, of research to studying one animal group, say a bird species, and then think that, you know, on the weekend as a kind of holiday activity, you can make up some uh, conclusions about a much more complicated species, namely our own.